welcome to Comms Life. I'm your host, Tom Billinghurst. Every week, we take you on a deep dive into the topics and trends shaping the communications industry and beyond. This year's Mental Health Month has arrived at a pertinent time for many. Since we've been forced to work, live, and socialize from our homes to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus pandemic, research is showing that the mental health of people forced to live under quarantine conditions is deteriorating at an alarming rate. This phase of the human experience has even been referred to as a heightened public mental health crisis. Joining us to discuss how we can come back from this social upheaval stronger than before is Marjorie Krauss, founder of APCO Worldwide, chair of the Women's President's Organization and author of Roots and Wings, a memoir about how the lessons of motherhood can lay the foundations for leadership in the wider world. Marjorie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Really important topic. <laughs> it is. It is a really important topic. So uh, thanks for taking the time to join us from stateside. How is life over there right now? It's confusing, I have to say. We, you know, we have uh, our states are just beginning to open up, but we're doing it in 50 different ways. So uh, it is a little confusing and challenging. We're, we're going to discuss with you today, obviously, the importance of mental health. Um, as a, as a kind of segue into it, I was going to throw this at you. It's a quote from the Nobel Prize winning American economist Milton Friedman, who in 1982 said, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And I think the ideas that are lying around right now, everywhere on a global level, is, is mental health. They have emerged front and center. So I wondered from a, a personal perspective for yourself, how you have seen this crisis play out compared to others that you've lived through. Well, I think the the most, if you want to call it unique thing about this crisis is that um, it's unlike any other one in the sense that you don't know when it's going to end, uh, not only how it's going to end, but you just, there's uh, so much uncertainty about uh, thinking beyond three months. And so we've had, you know, we've had this phase where everybody was trying to understand what's going on. And maybe some people thought it was temporary. I personally, uh, from the beginning, thought this is a long-term thing um, and that you could only think in terms of phases. So now we're into the, what, I, what I've been calling the end of the beginning. Um, and I think you know, for me, uh, what I've tried to do is to encourage our own people to just focus on what you can control, because so much of this is just not controllable. If you start to think about everything that can go wrong, then you um, get really paralyzed about being a leader. And part of being a leader is um, to give other people hope and a direction and some certainty about their own future even when there isn't a lot of certainty. You can be honest about it, but I think people have to trust that you have a path or that you'll find a path or that you'll work together to find a path. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you founded APCO 35 years ago, so you've been dealing with people and, and managing people in the comms space um, for three and a half decades. Uh, not to emphasize the point, of course. Um, <laughs> Especially I wonder... not on my birthday. <laughs> Today? Yeah. Happy birthday. Well, thank you. <laughs> you don't look a day over the 35 years that you founded it. I wonder how you've seen the change in people's behaviors over those 35 years. I feel like mental health is such an, a, a big topic at the moment, and it seems to have come almost out of nowhere. It's that we know more about it now. Is that the case or is it just? You know, uh, I probably have never said this in public, but um, I'm, I'm not a stranger to mental health. I lived um, with a mother who had serious um, illness, mental illness. And I think what I learned uh, through that process um, and watching my mother struggle is um, that society thought of this as what, it was one of those things you never talked about and you didn't know that much about, and you didn't think of it as a disease um, the same way you kind of think of it now. And so, yes, I think the situation has dramatically changed. And I think that um, not only is it much more a topic of uh, discussion, 
but I think that um, there's a lot more of it than any of us uh, realize by the stresses of today's society. And I think that's only exacerbated by what's going on now. So I think talking about these things is really important so that anyone who's struggling knows that it's not shameful to get help um, and to express their own, uh, their own concerns. How do companies embed this kind of mental health and wellness in the way they operate when staff come back? Well, I think they've never gone away. You know, that's the whole thing is that it's they've been working differently. And we have to be very careful to acknowledge that. We're not just saying when we get back to work, it's when we get back to the office, if we get back to the office. And because people have been really working very hard during this time under very difficult conditions. And I think the way we have to deal with it is being permissive. I think we uh, have to be very transparent about these things and very upfront. And we have to not force people into situations that create more stress. What's been really fascinating from a communications perspective as well is, you know, we are living in this, what feels like a relentless work cycle. Um, we are starting work at the same time. Um, we are finishing much later um, and it, it feels like, I don't know if this is the reality, but it feels like we're just going at a thousand miles per hour so much quicker than we ever used to. And one offshoot of that, there was a, a research study um, conducted by the Middle East PR Association out here that said that over 50% of people in working in comms and PR are experiencing some kind of anxiety or depression or panic. Do you think that's a unique aspect to the comms industry? No, I don't. I think that, um, first of all, there's been fundamental change in how people work. So any routine people had is, is not, um, is, has, been, um, has been changed. Everything's been disrupted. Um, you, you have, especially mothers of young children, um, and I guess fathers too, but, you know, you think about it, you're now working from home. So you had a routine where it was stressful enough when you had uh, young children getting up. I know I lived through this when my kids were young and getting, getting things set up and you'd have uh, taking them to a babysitter, have a babysitter come and then you'd go to work and then you'd, you know, you'd have dinner and you have all this stuff. And now um, you are the only provider of all of that and you're doing it all at one time and you're doing it all in one space. And trying to juggle all those different things and to do well at all of them is almost an impossible task. There's a quote that's um, often attributed to you. It might be apocryphal, um, but it's that work-life balance, not so much. Work-life integration is what we're looking for. Is that true? And what do you mean by that? Um, in my book, um, that's, I try to dispel this myth that you can have this perfect life with work-life balance because it's not true. On any given day, there is no balance. On a whole, you have to take it as a whole. There is some, some kind of thing that works out at the end, but it's because I think you take the best of what you've learned at business and you bring it home and you take the best of what's home and you bring it to business. It's all about who you are. And if you try to create these standards that are impossible to meet, you create more stress and you do create more mental distress, I think. Do you think that's intrinsic to the industry communications and PR that we're in, that it, it is relentless and it is nonstop? We are connected 24-7. I think it might be, but I don't, I don't like to think that we're the only ones that experience this. I think any profession where you are on call I mean, I, I, I think it's hard to believe that we would have more stress than the doctors during the coronavirus, you know, who had life and death decisions to make. Um, but I do think anytime you're on call and you want to do, you want to be a, um, a valued professional, you have a lot of stress. Absolutely. Um, one thing I, I keep thinking is I wonder if during this time we actually are busier I haven't had a single phone call with a colleague or a client or someone recently, and we haven't said, how are you doing? And oh, I'm surviving, you know, I'm, I'm just floating. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. It's okay. Everyone seems at their wits end. But I wonder whether we are actually churning out more work 
and we are busier or whether like we alluded to earlier, we're in the same space. We don't have the same routine. We don't have the same decompression on our drive to and from work to process everything, have dinner. And then if we need to carry on, we do carry on. I wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, I think, um, do I, I, I feel like I'm as busy as I've ever been. I think some days are really intense and I try to, uh, analyze why that's the case. And I do think we don't, we didn't recognize before that getting up and walking around the office and talking to colleagues is a break, you know, yeah. or yeah. for me, I traveled so much going to the airport is awful as, you know, it is waiting in line and doing all that. You are not thinking about work 24 seven in the same way. But yes, I feel like we're busy all the time that every minute matters. And with, with that business, as, as we've touched on before, we are going to need to find a way, organizations are going to need to find a way to give time back to the individual to make sure they're processing what they need to process, they're decompressing, whether it's working from home, whether it's being at the office three days a week. And I think something that captures this really nicely, especially as we're going through this phase as, as what the CDC has described as this public mental health crisis is... Uh, English writer Matt Haig wrote in his book, Reasons to Stay Alive, um, some of the reasons that make perseverance and resilience worthwhile. We can just have a little listen to what he has to say. You will one day experience joy that matches this pain. You will cry euphoric tears at the Beach Boys. You will stare down at a baby's face as she lies asleep in your lap. You will make great friends. You will eat delicious foods you haven't tried yet. You will be able to look at a view from a high place and not assess the likelihood of dying from falling. There are books you haven't read yet that will enrich you, films you will watch while eating extra large buckets of popcorn, and you will dance and laugh and go for runs by the river and have late night conversations and laugh until it hurts. Life is waiting for you. You might be stuck here for a while, but the world isn't going anywhere. Hang on in there if you can. Life is always worth it. Marjorie, thanks for sticking around. We'd now like to get to know you a little bit better with a few quick fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's do this. Your favorite superhero? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, <laughs> of course. Um, the worst habit you have developed since working from home? Uh, probably this, sitting in front of a computer for too long every day, doing Zoom calls. Takeout or home cooking? Oh, home cooking. I'm a great cook. I love to cook. And one thing about my job is I never got to do it. My husband is so happy. He's like, <laughs> I asked him last night, what is the best meal? And he's lit, he just went, I said, what's the best meal since we've been home? And he, what was it? What was he, he rattled off a dozen meals. That's it was amazing. like everything I had made. So I thought, and he's not a compliment giver. So I felt really good about that. Beautiful. What did you want to be when you were younger? An astronaut. Really? I don't what know if they were that? astronauts, but it was like an astronomer. I guess maybe that's better than, than there weren't astronauts, but okay. um, I was very um, a stargazer. Stargazer, yeah. And then I found out how much math was involved in being an astronomer and I <laughs> changed my mind. <laughs> no more Euclid. Let's just, let's go into comms. Uh, books or TV? Um, probably books. Earliest childhood memory? Um when my youngest brother who's four years younger than I am the night he was born my grandfather had a bakery and we lived in an apartment above the bakery and I remember um, a friend a family friend who was a priest in town coming over and coming into the house and we were very confused why father Steve was in the house and I remember he brought us ice cream I remember that and then he said we, that my mother was at the hospital and we were going to have a sibling. But I, I don't know why I remember that, but I remember it very clearly. Is living above a bakery as wonderful as it sounds for the smells that you think In the of? morning. 
Oh. Yeah, the first, the some of the early things I do remember is running downstairs, and my grandfather used to let me put the jelly in the jelly donuts. Wonderful. The technology you are most excited about? Um, <laughs> well, apropos what we're talking about, I guess cloning, right? You could be in two places <laughs> at one time. I, I think that would be nirvana for me. You know, I could be sitting yeah. with you there and I could be here. Yeah. And but then what, you... what better for work-life integration? <laughs> so, so true. But then, then your clone could do nefarious, not so above board activities and then blame you for it. I think that would confuse me. Uh, well, I have to have a good clone. Okay. But you have, you have train, a more... train your clone. You have to train. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the morals is the thing that I'm lacking there. I, I get that. The first place you will revisit when restrictions are lifted. I think probably the nail salon down the street. And finally, one moment in your life you would relive. One meaningful moment, probably incredible moment in my professional life was the day I signed the papers to make GAPCO independent. I mean, that was phenomenal. I raised the money. I, nobody thought I could. Um, everybody was kind of, you know, the whole industry, everybody was being bought and I was taking mm -hmm. APCO in a different direction. And um, it just was so perfect because it was so counterintuitive to, to every, you know, everything, everybody being a woman, doing that, raising money. Um, I get the impression that you like an underdog story. Well, I've always been kind of an underdog. So yeah, I do. There you go, right there. Marjorie, that was wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure having you on. Thanks. Take care. Thanks for listening to Comms Life. For more episodes, you can download the Comms Life podcast from Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Keep up to date with everything from the Comms Life team by following our social media pages on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Stay safe and be well.